up Paul Moritz, CEO of Pivotal, to talk to you about Pivotal and, and go down another level and uh, this transformational technology. Paul? Good morning. It's a great pleasure and privilege to be with you here today and to introduce to you uh, the newest member of the EMC family, uh, which is Pivotal. Now, at Pivotal, we're keying off what uh, Joe outlined to you, that we believe that there's a need and a huge opportunity to drive new value in our industry through a new generation of applications that exploit, amongst other things, big data and the full power of the cloud. You would have heard David yesterday and Joe today talk about the amazing work that uh, EMC and VMware are doing around the software-defined data center, providing a platform that can run, as Joe said, both second generation and third generation applications. We at Pivotal have been thinking very carefully about what can be done on top of that platform, on top of the software-defined data center to drive new experiences and new business models and consequently new business value. So we're girding our loins to go and build a new kind of platform, a platform higher up the stack that will sit on top of the software-defined data center and bring together these three things of big data, fast data, and a new generation of applications, but to do it in a way that emphasizes one of the key values that Joe outlined to you, which is choice. To be able to allow you to build these applications in a way that are independent of or portable across different underlying clouds. Because we believe at the end of the day, cloud should first and foremost be about how you do things not necessarily about where you do things. So I'm going to take you through our thinking behind uh, this effort this morning, introduce it to you, and I hope this will be the first of many conversations that we'll have around these ideas and our efforts to build a new platform. To introduce how we're thinking about this, this keys off what Joe spoke about earlier in terms of the three generations in IT the mainframe generation, the client-server generation, web generation, that's the second generation, and now this third generation uh, of apps and IT. And it is important because to think about the apps because at the end of the day, everything that we do in infrastructure and tools and data fabrics is really just about the apps. How do you write and run applications? Even data itself isn't useful unless you have the applications to bring that data to life and allow you to act upon that data to drive some real experience or new transaction or business model through to your end user. And we've gone through two generations of applications, starting with mainly financial applications on the mainframe, going to a much broader suite of applications in the second generation, CRM, full ERP, email, collaboration, etc. And each of these generations had its characteristic data fabrics and underlying hardware architectures. Uh, in the mainframe area, it is mostly the data fabrics of mostly ISAMs. Then we went to the relational database in the second generation. In this third generation, we're going to see new data fabrics and a new fundamental uh, com compute architecture sitting underneath that. So it's interesting to ask, where can we learn about this new generation of applications, this third generation platform that is coming. And the obvious place to look is to the consumer internet giants, because they've had to pioneer in this space. When Google set about trying to index all of the world's information, they simply could not technically do that on top of a second generation architecture. They had to innovate and build new infrastructure, new data fabrics, new compute architectures to allow them to tackle that application. And we've seen other applications come out from the consumer internet world which similarly 
have demanded new data fabrics and a new architecture. So when you set out on this journey, you want to look and say, what have the pioneers done? And we've looked very closely at what these large consumer internet giants have been doing. And if you simplify things somewhat, you can say that these consumer internet giants have learned how to do the following three things. Firstly, they've built the capability to be able to store and reason over much larger data sets much more cost effectively. If you're going to start with trying to reason over terabytes and petabytes of data, you simply cannot go a traditional EDW or database route. Quite apart from the fact that it technically wouldn't be possible, you'd go bankrupt uh, trying to do that at the pricing that we've traditionally seen in that marketplace. So they had to innovate. When Google set out on their journey, the one of the first innovations they had was GFS, the Google File System, which is a form of scale-out object store, similar to what David was talking about yesterday. That has been generalized now through the open source industry into Hadoop and H HDFS, and that is becoming a very important substrate, which I'll uh, highlight for you later on. Secondly, these consumer internet giants have a culture of rapid application development. Uh, one reads about how if you're a developer at Facebook today, you're encouraged to deploy your first app live on their website on your very first day of work. Now, we can roll our eyes and say, you know, really what kind of app is that and how ambitious is it and does it do anything more than just move a pixel from one side of the screen to the other. But you ask, how many enterprises do you know where a developer, a brand new developer, can join that enterprise and deploy anything, let alone in production, in their first day of work. They have figured out how to build their processes, their infrastructure, to really allow them to introduce new experiences very rapidly. And as part of doing that, they've had to automate their way to get there. You don't get to that level of agility and that level of capability by trying to layer more and more levels of management on things. You have to tackle it fundamentally as an automation problem. And they are operate, able to operate at the scale and the efficiency and the agility that they do because they built their data centers, their computer architectures, their data fabrics with automation in mind. So we need to look at these three capabilities and say, if enterprises want to be competitive in the future, if they want to deliver new business models, if they want to deliver new experiences to their customers, if they want to compete in this age of mobile devices, of social networks, etc., they're going to have to learn how to get some of this mojo. So at Pivotal, we've been thinking about how do we take some of these capabilities and bring them in an appropriate way back into the enterprise. Now, these are not the only drivers of change. Uh, as you heard Joe and others say, there's another very important change happening in the world, and that is uh, the Internet of Things. The fact that in the future, literally everything that is made, from a toaster to a jet engine, is going to be able to continuously report its status back to its controlling authority all the time. This is going to generate an enormous flood of data. I, I was a couple of weeks ago talking to uh, our new partners, General Electric, and, and uh, one of their customers in the airline business. Uh, they were telling me that if you could capture all the data of a single transatlantic flight by a 777 aircraft, that would be 30 terabytes of data that they would like to now ingest in, and examine and react to. So not only is the number of things attached to the Internet going to go up by two orders of magnitudes, we're going to go up from not just having billions of users attached to the Internet, but we're going to get to where we have hundreds of billions of devices attached to the Internet. But those devices are going to produce a flood of information that needs to be examined, reasoned over, and reacted to that's going to go up by a similar two orders of magnitude. So we have to provide ways where businesses can transform themselves by not only being able to look at data at rest, data that they already have stored, but data as it's coming into them, and data that's potentially arriving in very large quantities and very rapidly. And this is what we call fast data. So we think the transformation is not just about big data, 
that it's about data that's arriving in real time, fast data where you have to also react in real time. Now, as Joe said, in the enterprise, we're going to have second generation and even first generation applications for a very long time to come. Some of those applications are just fine. They do what they do very effectively. They don't need to be rewritten. And what we need to do is to take those second generation applications onto the software defined data center where they can sit alongside third generation applications. And we need to provide the means where those two sets of applications can essentially exchange data and interact with each other. So we need to have architectures to allow interaction with existing applications as we go forward, particularly important in the enterprise. In addition, in the enterprises, not all enterprises are going to choose to go and build their own clouds. Some enterprises will, but not all enterprises are going to want to go and build a Google scale or an Amazon scale data, uh, data center. They're going to want to take advantage of that when it makes sense for them to do so. So we want to provide a level of automation and the ability to construct these applications, but do it in a way where the enterprise can decide where they want to get the underlying data center capacity from. We don't want this third generation of applications to go back to being like the first generation, the mainframe generation, where if you wrote a COBOL or Kix app 30 or 40 years ago, you are condemned to pay IBM attacks in all eternity. Uh, we don't want to get it so that when you go back and write an application and deploy it in Amazon's data center, for instance, you're condemned to pay Amazon attacks in all eternity. We need the modern equivalent of an operating system. If you think of these new clouds that are coming out there from VMware, from Amazon, from other sources as, figuratively speaking, the new hardware, we need a new operating system that will give us a degree of cloud independence so that we can write applications in a cloud independent way, just as Linux gave us hardware independence. So if you wrote a Linux application, you had a greater rather than a lesser chance of being able to move that application over generations of hardware and different vendors' uh, approaches. So we are looking to take these five capabilities and knit them together in an open way in a new, into a new platform, a new platform for the cloud era. And uh, we're calling our instantiation of this platform Pivotal One. So right now, our team at Pivotal, as uh, Joe said, about uh, 1,300 people strong, is beavering away, building towards the first release of this platform. And this platform will have important attributes to it. It will be very strongly anchored in open source. Uh, it will be layered appropriately so that you can make choices as to which pieces of the platform you wish to implement, but it will be integrated. It will be multi-cloud to give you the ability to deploy this platform and its applications over different clouds, whether it be VMware's cloud, who will work very closely with Pat and his team, but also other vendors' clouds. And we're trying to really think of the needs of developers and the enterprises as we go forward. We think of this platform as comprising three categories of capabilities. At the bottom, what we call cloud fabric, and then sitting on the cloud fabric, a new generation of data fabrics, and a new generation of application fabrics. So I'm going to go through each of these three categories and uh, briefly outline for you the work that we're doing there. Starting with the data fabrics, which is some of the most in where some of the most interesting innovation is occurring, what we see there is as we go into this third generation, all of the data fabrics are getting remade around this principle of using a scale-out object store in the form of HDFS as the underlying persistence layer. If there's one thing that everyone knows about data, it's this, that the more of your data you can get in one place, the better off you are. If you have your data balkanized everywhere in multiple places with multiple personalities, multiple schemas, multiple tool chains associated with them, you're going to have a harder time getting value out of that data. So people are starting to think very carefully about 
how do we get more of our data in one place? So if you go to large enterprises today, you'll hear phrases like a data landing zone or a data lake, where they're trying to say, we need in the future to build a scalable capability where we can put more, if not all, of our data. And that data set is going to be very, very large. Because if you think about this coming world of telemetry and the Internet of Things, you're going to have data that's not just coming from your customers and their orders pouring into there, but you're going to be pouring into there all sorts of information coming from sensors, from mobile networks, etc. And you want to get that into that data landing zone or data lake so you can build a complete picture of what the experience that you're actually trying to deliver. So that underlying data repository has to be, have two or three very important attributes. First of all, it has to be able to scale to be very large. It has to scale to the petabyte scale. Secondly, it has to be cost effective. Uh, you can't go bankrupt trying to build that thing. And thirdly, it has to be highly reliable. So we need a, a substrate there that is optimized around scale, cost, and reliability. And that's really what this whole HDF movement is about. And as David outlined to you yesterday, you're going to see EMC swing all of its enormous heritage of storage technology behind providing that kind of a layer, a layer that scales, is cost effective, and highly reliable. What we at Pivotal are trying to do is to then build the semantic capabilities on top of that by using in-memory technology. And by in-memory technology, I mean scale out in-memory technology. I don't mean a single memory space. I mean lots of memory spaces working together. Because the underlying cloud hardware, the infrastructure clouds that Pat and others are building, make it easy to ask for a lot of memory spaces. We can just say, we want 100 or 500 or even 1,000 memory spaces that we're going to use to basically reason over and interact with this data. So we need to take the capabilities to ingest data that's arriving in large quantities in real time, to clean it up, put it into that underlying substrate, react to it in real time if we need to. We need the capability to query over it so that we can start to do analytics on it at scale and we need to eventually do transactions. We need to actually provide the full data lifecycle sitting on top of an HDFS substrate. So to do that, what we've done is we've taken assets out of EMC and assets out of VMware where we have the expertise to do that. Firstly, we took in Greenplum. As you know, that's a company that EMC acquired about ten year, uh, two years ago. But they have 10 years of heritage working on in-memory scale-out query. The founders of that company come from the high-performance computing space. They had worked with very large-scale data grids, and they decided to put their knowledge of doing that kind of computing towards parallel query. So inside the Greenplum database, which many of you know, there's a query processor embedded in there that knows how to basically use lots of memory spaces to execute high-scale, real-world SQL queries extremely rapidly. So we've taken that, as I'll show you in a moment, and pulled that out and now re-hosted that on top of an HDFS substrate. The next thing we're doing is we're taking expertise and technology that comes from Gemfire. That's a company that VMware had acquired about two years ago, who have basically in-memory transactional capability. All right, they cut their teeth, amongst uh, other places, in supporting real-time trading on Wall Street. So they are the harness that many of the large banks on Wall Street use to do their real-time automatic trading, where you've got to ingest literally hundreds of thousands of events per second, and then react to them, do things, and know that you've done them in a highly reliable way. So they do transaction processing on very large numbers of events coming in in real time. So they have experience, again, using this paradigm of building semantics using a scale-out in-memory model. So we're bringing them into the family so that they will give us the transactional capability to complement Greenplum's query technology. Now, just to illustrate this for you, uh, we recently re released our first product that fits this paradigm, and that is something called Pivotal HD. 
And what Pivotal HD does is take a standard Apache Hadoop distribution and add into that Greenplum's capability to do very high scale in memory query technology. So they take all of the normal components that you'd find in a standard Hadoop distribution, and uh, here's the alphabet soup of things that you'd find inside a Hadoop distribution. But they then put into that this collection of query technology that we call Hawk. Hawk stands for, imaginatively, Hadoop with query. Uh, and uh, what it allows you to do is to pull the information out of the HDFF substrate into memory. It has a very sophisticated query processor that plans the query over multiple machines, executes the query, returns the results to you. And the results of this, quite frankly, are simply stunning. Uh, we ran some benchmarks here against other companies that are trying to do a similar thing, which is to do query on top of a very large scale HDFS substrate. Firstly, we had a hard time just finding queries that would run on our competitors' products. So we had to kind of dumb it down and just choose very simple queries. But you can see basically anything from 10 to hundreds of times performance advantage. And the reason for this is that 10 years of experience and history building parallel query processing capability. This is now at the right place, at the right time for us to really be able to deliver this as an enormous capability to the user and allow people to move towards this next generation view of how they want to manage data, get more of their data in one place, store it very cost effectively, highly reliably, and then have different semantic models on top of that to analyze the data. Briefly, I want to touch on the application fabrics. Uh, here, uh, we've brought into the picture assets from VMware. Uh, as you know, VMware was the custodian of the Spring programming uh, framework, which is the largest and most popular programming framework in the Java world. Mm -hmm. And uh, the reason for that is, is not only uh, can we provide a path for the literally one plus million Spring programmers to move into the cloud age. But secondly, the Spring framework brings with it a very rich library of connectors into second platform applications. So over the last 10 years, the Spring community has written connectors that allow you to connect into existing data sources and applications of almost every conceivable type because Spring above else is an enterprise development framework and it has a lot of the capabilities to interact with that second generation uh, of applications. In addition, we're building into support for a variety of languages and frameworks, not just Spring, but all of the modern programming frameworks, whether it be the Ruby family or the JavaScript family. But we're building in a higher le level, a higher level set of services that developers can take advantage of. A very good example of that is we will bake into this platform an analytics service. So if you're writing an application, you can just essentially make callouts and pass information over to an analytic engine that will do two things. One, it'll give you a lot of information on about how your customers are using that application, but it'll also allow you to project that analytic capability directly through to the end user. So this is an example of, how to, of building in higher level services into the platform. And then sitting underneath all of this is what we call Cloud Fabric. The Cloud Fabric you can think of very loosely as the operating system for the cloud age. This is what allows us to make sure that the applications can take advantage of multiple clouds underneath us. So we can make this simply a deployment decision as opposed to an architectural decision as to whether you want to deploy this full set of applications and the services associated with them on a private cloud, running in your data center, on VMware vCloud, for instance, or you can deploy it into Pat's upcoming vCloud hybrid service, where he essentially will build a virtual data center for you in the cloud, or you can deploy it into the, one of our service providers, uh, running OpenStack, for instance, or God forbid, you can even decide to put it in uh, Microsoft's Azure cloud 
or Amazon's AWS cloud. <laughs> uh, this is an example of what Joe said in terms of being really serious about choice. Uh, it was a very successful strategy when Joe gave VMware the freedom and mandate to work with the storage industry at large. From day one, when VR EMC acquired VMware, EMC, as the custodians of VMware, made it clear that they were empowered to work with the ecosystem on a level playing field basis. Similarly, we're going to apply that lesson again here. We're going to say pivotal, even though we will work very closely with our EMC family members, pivotal is empowered to work with the ecosystem and to do what makes best sense for the customer. Inside uh, that layer, you get uh, the cloud abstraction capability, the service registry, which allows you to register these new services for uh, applications, and it has a very sophisticated application and lifecycle and provisioning model. This layer was actually architected by an initial set of folks who came over from Google who worked on Google's Borg engine. And the one thing that they drilled into our heads is that in this cloud world, you can never go down. When you run a true as a service application, you never take it down. You never say on Sunday night, we're going to go down for two hours of maintenance. <laughs> you have to do your upgrades in place, in real time. And that's a tricky thing to do. And they said the enemy of reliability is the human. <laughs> so you've got to, wherever you ca can, automate your way out of processes. If you're reliant on scripts, and checklists and things like that, sooner or later, something's going to go wrong and you're going to screw up. So you have to build the automation into the platform. So built into this cloud fabric layer is the automation for application provisioning and lifecycle. And this layer, we think, needs to be open, not only in the sense of working across multiple clouds, but it really needs to be open to the entire industry. And that reason, that's the reason why we've made sure that this layer, which is based on technology that we call Cloud Foundry is not only open, but open source. This whole suite of technologies is available under an Apache 2 license. Uh, you can go to cloudfoundry.com because we believe very strongly that at the end of the day, the development community and the open source community will not allow the cloud era to go be it back and be like the closed era of the mainframe era. Eventually, they would have made sure that there is the cloud area equivalent of Linux, something that cloaks these clouds and allows you to write your applications in a portable manner. So rather than resist that, we've decided to embrace that and make this layer freely available to everyone in the industry. And we invite anyone who has interest to come and work with us uh, on this project. So we're pulling these three strands together, uh, cloud fabric, data fabrics, application fabrics, and it's our goal to have the first release of all of these pieces together as an integrated whole, as an integrated suite by the end of this year. Now, you don't have to wait until the end of the year to get started. There are multiple entry points into this world, and what's more, we're not making it so that you have to buy the whole in order to enjoy some of the benefits of one of the constituent pieces. You don't have to buy necessarily our fa app fabric to use our data fabric or vice versa. So we have starting points here today. The data fabrics, as I said, are based upon the Green Plum database technology and Gemfire technology. The latest incarnation of that where we take the query technology and place that on top of HDFS for very cost-effective large-scale data analytics applications is available now. That's the first product that uh, we've given the Pivotal la label to. That's Pivotal HD. Came out just available just a couple of weeks ago. All right. In the application space, the Spring and vFabric parts that will be subsumed into this platform are available. And again, you can start working with those without having to buy into our data fabrics or even our cloud fabrics. And uh, we also have a set of services, some real, you know, skilled developers who can work with you to make these pieces work for you. So the company that EMC acquired a year ago, which we've actually taken the name from, is a company called Pivotal Labs. Mm -hmm. uh, and these are a, a group of 250 extreme developers located mainly up in San Francisco, but now in London and New York. 
And uh, they have a history of writing applications for Silicon Valley. They are the go-to firm if you're a VC in Silicon Valley and you have somebody who has a good idea but no ability to write applications, they are the firm that you go to. They were, in fact, the first firm that Google worked with as an outside contractor. For many years, they only were the only contracting firm that Google would let into their environment. And uh, they practice extreme programming. Uh, so they have an interesting model where uh, if you want something done, you have to commit to send a person or persons with domain expertise to sit with them in San Francisco or now London, New York, New York, and they build a team around your people, and then that team functions as a extreme programming agile team for three to six months to get the job done. We're finding it's very interesting because as more companies start to think about the mobile era, where you have to show your functionality directly through to the end user, companies, enterprises are starting to think more like VCs. They're thinking, hmm. I want this application not only done rapidly, but I want it done right first time. I want it to look great the first time it hits uh, the end user. So they're no longer interested in purely trying to find the cheapest guys in the most re remote location who can write some code for them. They are really saying we need a high quality experience. And a lot of our customers are actually coming to work with Pivotal Labs to discover how to do development as it's done in Silicon Valley in the year 2013, and how do you de literally deliver very high quality end user experiences in a short period of time. And we're very happy for that to happen. We view this as a knowledge transfer capability uh, that we're investing in. And then uh, shortly, we will have the Cloud Foundry layer sitting on top of uh, both internal and external clouds. Uh, in particular, we'll have it available uh, to sit on top of the vCloud hybrid cloud service and on Amazon, demonstrating the cloud portability and cloud independence capabilities of that cloud fabric uh, platform. So that is a uh, quick tour uh, of Pivotal. And uh, as you know, uh, Pivotal is a member of the EMC family. So we were born, if you can go back one slide, uh, we were born uh, as a initially jointly owned by uh, VMware and by EMC, majority owned by uh, EMC and 30% owned by VMware. And then uh, uh, two weeks ago, we announced a very exciting piece of news, which was that we have a new owner, which is General Electric. And you might ask, why is General Electric, if we can just go back one slide, uh, this 130-year-old company, uh, renowned for being in the heavy metal space. Why are they investing in this platform? And the answer is they see their industrial businesses undergoing rapid change in the future. They see the opportunity to transform the value of a jet engine or a gas turbine or a locomotive by being able to take in all of that telemetry and deliver new value to their customers. And not only that, they see that their business models are going to have to change. So increasingly, if you're, if you look at their jet engine business, they're starting to do deals where they don't just sell the engine. They essentially commit to provide the airline with 10,000 hours of power or 15,000 hours of power, and the engine remains on their books, and they're responsible for the health and welfare of that engine, which means the profitability of that venture goes from the pure sale of the engine to how efficiently they can do servicing of a jet engine. And jet engines today are serviced in just about the most inefficient way you can possibly imagine, which is simply you take a worst case view all the time. <laughs> uh, so, you assume that the, the engine's broken, you take it off the airplane uh, every 2,000 hours, you break it down to the smallest components because you assume that everything is broken. <laughs> Whereas if you could get the telemetry of those engines, you would know at all times, in real time, what the state of that engine is, and you can move to a much more intelligent way of servicing those engines, not only much more profitable to you, but much more disrupt less disruptive to your customers. So when GE talks about the industrial internet, it's not just that they're saying 
that everything in the future will have telemetry and be able to report its status back. They're saying even us, the mighty, well-established GE, our businesses are at risk of being disrupted. We could end up just being benders of metal and not deliverers of the real value-added services. So that is why they've gone out in, in, on a limb here and looked at us and said, yes, from what we can see, you are trying to build a capability that we think is going to be crucial to our future, to the transformation of this 130-year-old uh, business. And uh, they have put their money where their mouths are, and we're, uh, for us, it's a, a tremendous honor. So with that, thank you very much, and I wish you that a very fruitful and uh, productive show. <laughs>